Um, GiveWell's research evolution looking for the most cost-effective opportunities. It is James Snowden. James is a senior research analyst at GiveWell, where he investigates giving opportunities related to policy. His work previously was as a strategist and researcher for Giving What We Can and the Center for Effective Altruism. James may be revealed now. Yes, amazing. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, so my name's James, I'm a researcher at GiveWell, um, and I'm just gonna give a quick update on uh, some of the work we're doing to investigate giving opportunities related to policy. Um, so just before I start, could I, could I have a quick show of hands of who's roughly familiar with GiveWell's previous work? Great, all of you, uh, that's great. It's mostly my colleagues in the front row, so. <laughs> Um, cool, so I'm not gonna kind of go over what GiveWell's done before. I think most of you are already familiar with that. I'm just gonna kind of cut to the chase and give you an update on, on the work we've been doing more recently. Um, so first I'll kind of talk a little bit about how GiveWell is changing and, and, and why. Um, then I'll give an update on our current work um, with a focus on policy and in particular public health regulation. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what this means for GiveWell kind of long term and also what it might mean for, for people in this room. Uh, so GiveWell's mission is to find uh, the best giving opportunities we possibly can um, to help the global poor and publish all our research and, and rationale online so donors can choose where to give. Um, in the past, we've generally focused on direct delivery, uh, so kind of funding organizations which deliver bed nets, uh, deliver cash transfers, or, or vitamin A supplementation, that kind of work. Um, and the reason for that has generally been, uh, you know, in 2007, when GiveWell was started, uh, it was started by two people with, with very little experience in the global health and development space. Um, and so they wanted to work in areas that were easier to quantify, easier to compare, um, and also where donors could kind of trust our judgments, because I think there's, well, while there's still a lot of judgment calls involved in kind of deciding which is the most cost-effective giving opportunity in terms of direct delivery, I think it's, it's often like more objective, I think, than some of the really thorny questions that we have to tackle in policy. Um, and then over the last couple of years, you know, this has been evolving and GiveWell's kind of been thinking about this for a while, but really kind of this last year, we've been making progress on this question. Um, and so I think two things have changed. You know, now we've been doing this work for 12 years. Um, we have a lot more experience in global health and development. Uh, we've recently hired people who I think are well equipped to help us with this work. Um, and also, I think we built up some level of trust with donors, uh, so we can make more subjective judgment calls, and I think we have, donors might have some reason to believe that we're not just talking nonsense. Um, so what does this actually mean in terms of the areas that are now in scope, um, which weren't previously? So I think kind of one way of carving up the space is into policy, um, other direct interventions, which we previously weren't considering, and also science. Um, so policy-related giving opportunities, which is uh, the kind of area that I'll be talking about today. Um, direct interventions with less experimental or less generalizable evidence. So for example, um, we think it's a lot harder to make conclusions uh, in the education sector than it is in health because of issues around generalizability. And previously that's been a reason for us to really kind of drop that research and say, okay, this isn't somewhere where we can make really strong conclusions. And now we want to be thinking, okay, like what do we actually believe though? What is our best guess? And, and how can we come to reasoned judgments in areas that are harder to evaluate? And then the third area, um, which is really, we, ha we haven't uh, made a lot of progress in this area yet, but generally in the kind of field of science and are there particular technologies that we think could have a large impact um, on the global poor. So for example, looking into whether there are opportunities to uh, fund an improved diagnostic tool for pneumonia. So policy is gonna be the focus of this talk. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of brief overview of like, why policy. And, and just as a kind of general caveat up front, like, a lot of this, I've got 20 minutes to talk about a year's work. Um, so I'm not gonna be going into as much detail as, as you would you know, typically expect from GiveWell. We also haven't um, yet written publicly about this work. Uh, we're hoping to in the coming weeks. And so you know, if you're curious about any of the questions or want uh, kind of the backup to anything I'm saying, uh, either come find me after the talk. Um, I've got office hours at three o'clock uh, or we will be publishing, you know, in the, hopefully in the next few weeks, um, an update which will give more of the details behind what I'm saying here. Um, so why policy? Well, I think there are kind of broadly two reasons why we think this might be uh, a good area for us to find better giving opportunities. So one is just as a very strong intuitive case. Um, I think that a very small amount of funding to which is directly well could, and to change policy could potentially improve a lot of lives because often you're covering a whole country um, and for a long time because 
changes in policy often last you know, many years into the future without necessarily the need for additional philanthropic assistance. Um, and then the other thing is, like, there are some interventions that can only really be done by government. So thankfully, you know, NGOs don't have the power to go into a low-income country and just change the law, um, which is a very good thing. Uh, but it means often if you, if you want to do particular things, you have to work with government. Um, we're also aware that this is going to be a challenging area, both to assess um, and also just to work in. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. So we think you know, there's going to be a high chance of failure. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of the grants we recommend um, end up having close to zero uh, effect. Um, it's very hard to predict um, kind of when policy windows will open up and whether um, the kind of particular context will be amenable to, uh, to making a difference. So that's kind of one issue. Um, the second issue is that causal attribution to particular actors um, is particularly hard. So, you know, when a policy change happens, it's very hard to say, right, you know, this group was 20% responsible for it, this group was 30%. And those are really difficult judgment calls. Um, I don't think we've totally nailed, like, how to do that. Um, but it does mean that a lot of our reasoning is likely to be more qualitative um, than it was previously. Um, the third kind of thing that I think makes policy particularly challenging um, is often, and this isn't always the case, but often it's very difficult to evaluate um, a particular policy change for an experimental lens. And so if a policy comes into place in a country, it'll often come to place in the whole country at the same time. So you don't have a good kind of control treatment comparison. Um, and then the fourth, I think, just an area that something we have to be very conscious of is the risk of excessive paternalism. Um, so kind of understanding that as outsiders, we have kind of limited knowledge um, and making sure we're kind of working through democratic institutions um, as far as possible. Uh, so that's kind of a brief update about, you know, what, why, are we, why are we working on this area? And I'll just kind of talk a little bit about our tentative conclusions uh, so far. Um, so first of all, just policy is a huge space, right? And it's not just like one thing. Um, and there are multiple ways of carving up this space, but just to give like some ideas for the kinds of uh, things you can do. I think I have a, yeah. So, uh, you know, what, what could you do to improve what governments, um, how effectively governments operate within a country? So one might be um, helping governments choose better programs. Um, so you might want to fund some kind of group which uh, would kind of evaluate different programs and give advice to the government about like which things do we think are most effective. And if you can improve the effectiveness of their spending, um, that could be potentially very impactful. Uh, there's also opportunities um, to influence possibly economic policy, so trade policy, fiscal policy, uh, industrial policy, um, immigration, which I think you know often there might be certain policies that high income countries have, which might have negative externalities on, on poorer countries. Um, political institutions, uh, kind of, you know, if we figure that out, I think we've, we've done very well. Um, uh, kind of improving the tax collection system uh, and also just kind of various other kind of functions of the government. So not everything that governments do is run programs, you know, improving the judiciary system or just improving the kind of way the administration works could be very impactful. Um, now the area we chose to focus on to start with was public health regulation. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. So one is that we think uh, it's potentially an area which is particularly impactful. Um, and if, we've looked, if we look back in the past, I think there are examples of, for example, tobacco taxation. There's, there's fairly, you know, non-experimental, but I think fairly compelling evidence that increases in tobacco taxation generally result in decreases in tobacco-related illnesses. Um, we also think that there are opportunities for uh, outside philanthropic assistance to help in this area. Um, so it's not just about funding kind of grassroots advocacy campaigns, it's also about providing technical assistance, um, providing research, and there are kind of lots of areas where outside assistance might be able to help. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we kind of wanted to start with a space that was kind of starting from where we are and give world's experience, uh, and where we could use those, the tools and the, the abilities that we built up over time um, to make good decisions. And I think what maybe distinguishes public health regulation from many of the other uh, kind of bubbles on this, on this slide um, is it's often kind of fairly proximate to impact, right? So you know, maybe political institutions, there's a lot of things that have to happen before that filters through to improve people's lives. Um, and also they're fairly kind of defined interventions. And so you might be able to take evidence from one setting and then apply it to another setting. So our work so far um, has basically tried to find, okay, what are the areas within public health regulation that we think GiveWell might want to focus on in the future? Um, and so the way we did this, our kind of first kind of long list uh, we took from the global burden of disease um, and went through kind of different uh, risk factors and also kind of causes of death um, and disability 
uh, and kind of just kind of thought, okay, are there like regulatory opportunities to improve um, to, to help tackle this burden? Um, and that kind of narrowed it. We, we kind of used that heuristic to narrow down to kind of nine areas. Um, we've also got a number of other areas that we hope to come back to in the future. And then the kind of primary way that we distinguished between these areas was to think, okay, uh, how much money is currently being spent? Um, so kind of a, a, a proxy for neglectedness, and what is the current disease burden um, of this area? And once we kind of went through that, three areas really stood out, um, and that's alcohol control, lead paint elimination, and pesticide regulation. Um, I will note on the next slide, there are kind of a number of difficulties and like, limitations of this methodology, um, and we hope to kind of go back and refine it over time. But I think this is a kind of example of when GiveWell is doing early work, we really want to be broad rather than kind of narrowing down and doing like, deep research in one area first, because we often find that once you've done that, you kind of become attached to that area. Um, so you want to kind of start broad and shallow. So alcohol control, lead paint elimination, and, and pesticide regulation, generally, um, if you take how much was spent on them and divide it by the burden and then compared it to the other areas we looked at, uh, they, they were generally three to five times less um, than some of the kind of best other areas we looked at. Uh, and they're, they're all kind of roughly similar uh, on that metric. So alcohol control, first I'll just kind of give a brief overview of each. Um, so alcohol control, uh, alcohol, according to the Global Burden of Disease, is responsible for about 1.2 million deaths every year in uh, low and lower middle income countries. Um, and our best guess is that under $5 million a year is spent on it, um, on, and specifically on advocacy to, uh, for better alcohol policies. Um, and if you compare that to tobacco control, which is an area that's received a lot more attention, so tobacco is responsible for about one and a half times uh, more kind of burden of disease than alcohol, but about 15 times as much is spent on it every year. So alcohol looks like a particularly promising area because it looks kind of superficially very similar to tobacco in many ways, although there are also important differences. Um, but an area that just hasn't received nearly as much attention. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking into kind of what we could do in this area, um, the kind of the best buys which are defined by the WHO and that we need to kind of look into deeper, are uh, alcohol taxes, um, marketing, regula uh, marketing restrictions, um, and also kind of restrictions on when you can purchase alcohol. Um, we've got a number of remaining questions also in this area, so we haven't yet vetted fully the global burden of disease kind of estimates. And we also want to be just very careful and think about, okay, we'll you know, many of us enjoy alcohol, that's probably okay. Uh, and how would we factor that in um, to, uh, into, into the kind of cost-benefit analysis? So that's one area. Um, and I'd say kind of what, what distinguishes alcohol is it's just compared to the other two areas, I think it's, it's just a very big burden of disease where the other two are kind of slightly more niche, but perform well, I think, particularly on a neglectedness um, criterion. So lead paint elimination is something that I... I know, I know it's kind of, I think it's been a big thing in the US for a while, but something I hadn't really heard of in the UK, um, where I grew up. And uh, so basically there, there's some evidence, and it, it's not strong evidence in itself, but I think um, the case is kind of consistent with uh, the kind of broader evidence base and what we know about lead. Um, so there's some evidence that exposure to lead paint during childhood can have really large effects on uh, people's cognitive development, and that can affect their earnings later in life. Um, that comes from a kind of series of multivariate regressions, which is, I would say, not um, completely dispositive. But there are reasons to think that, that this might be true. And so we know that lead is a very toxic metal. Um, we know that uh, children in, a lot of children in low-income countries have very high blood lead levels. Um, and we know this has to be coming from somewhere, because the natural kind of level without exposure to lead, of, of lead in your blood is, is very close to zero. Um, and those countries often have already eliminated lead in gasoline. Uh, so paint is often, is, is widely considered to be one of the most important uh, contributors to that. Um, I think under $3 million is spent on lead each year, um, or specifically on lead paint elimination. Um, and it appears to be an area that's got some level of tractability. Um, so a number of countries in the last 20 years have, uh, uh, have brought in new restrictions. Um, the third area, pesticide regulation, is actually it, it's something we've talked about, I talked about before at last year's EA Global, um, and it's an area we've already made a grant in. So uh, just to kind of sketch out the case, this is specifically about, the, um, uh, about reducing suicide. Um, so about 150,000 people a year die from deliberately ingesting uh, pesticide each year. Um, and there's some evidence from Sri Lanka in the 1990s, which used to have one of the highest suicide rates in the world, 
that targeted um, restrictions on certain pesticides um, led, well, coincided with a reduction in suicides of about 50%, which is one of the largest sustained reductions in suicide uh, in history. Um, now, that's like, that's literally a time trend, right? So, like, this evidence isn't great, um, but it's kind of backed up by the medical records. And so you see this shift in the pesticides people are taking, uh, people are drinking in, in suicide attempts um, from very high toxicity ones to lower ones. And so you see an improvement in the survival rate. And if people survive a suicide attempt, they're actually more likely than not not to try again. So these are the three areas um, that we currently consider top priority. Um, we're definitely going to come back to a lot of these areas. I think two which I'm particularly excited about. Um, one is iron fortification in India, which has a very high burden of um, iron deficiency anemia. And so you can pass certain regulations to uh, mandate that producers of, say, wheat or rice um, put uh, various vitamins in at like an early stage before it gets to the table. Um, that's an area we want to do more work in. And another one that we found particularly challenging to assess is ambient air pollution, which is a very large burden of disease. But one of the things that makes this tricky is a lot of the things that you would do to reduce um, particulate matter, which is the kind of cause of direct um, human health from air pollution, uh, that, that will overlap substantially with what you might do to reduce CO2 emissions. And so it was kind of challenging to assess for our framework. Um, because do you include all the funding that is spent on uh, CO2 reduction kind of in that, in, in that kind of bucket? And I think that's kind of one of the things that we found pretty challenging about this. Um, so I think just kind of want to note for like problems with our methodology, and these are things that we hope to kind of go back to and, and improve in the future. Um, so one is that we've generally used um, the total burden of disease as a kind of proxy for importance. Um, I think that does leave something out. So we probably, well, we're never going to reduce alcohol consumption to zero, or at least not in the short term. And it's not even obvious that we should be trying to. Um, and so that might, that might kind of lead some areas to be kind of overweighted just because um, they have a large burden of disease, even if, like, plausibly you could only make, say, a 10% impact on that. Um, the second, and we, we kind of took this into account somewhat, but it's very challenging to assess, is uh, how tractable particular policy changes might be. Um, so, for example, lead paint elimination appears to be an area where industry are generally on board with the need to do this. Um, so it did play, like, some role in our prioritization, um, but the kind of it, it, our understanding, um, and it appears to be consensus in people working in this area, is it's very hard to predict which policies will be tractable at which times, and policy windows can often kind of come like in the very short term, and so we think we'd be missing a trick if we deprioritized an area just because we think it's hard right now. Um, the third, I think we've still got a lot more work to do on the cost effectiveness of different regulations, um, and we will do that in future before we invest in this, in this area. And the fourth, as you might have noticed, is kind of a different level of granularity that we're treating some of these areas at. So if we, instead of looking at pesticide suicide specifically, we looked at suicide in general, it's possible we would have, would have come to different answers. Um, and the implication of that is I think some of the areas that we looked at at a very broad level and deprioritized um, might actually contain specific things within them which look very good. Uh, cool, so I've got two and a half minutes left. Um, I'll just kind of quickly talk about what this means for GiveWell uh, and also what it might mean for, for people in this room. Um, so we're really excited about this work. Uh, we think that it's um, the most likely work that leads us to uh, become far more cost effective than we currently are. Uh, and to recommend yeah, giving opportunities that are far better than what, what we currently have. Um, we do expect to continue recommending top charities on our traditional criteria in the future. We don't think anything about that is going to change, um, at least in the near term, although it might well be that if we identify enough policy-related opportunities, the amount of funding that goes to those top charities uh, will be diminished. Um, we still want to keep transparency as a core value. We're still going to commit to writing up um, any recommendations we have in, in a lot of detail. Um, I think just while being cognizant that I think there will be more often times like things that will be difficult to share. Um, and so we've never really had, Givewell's never really had enemies before. Um, and there, you know, there aren't groups which are trying to stop bed nets being distributed, uh, whereas that might not be the case in areas like alcohol or tobacco where you have well-funded industrial opposition. So I think we just have to be very careful about what we can share and when while maintaining a kind of commitment to, to transparency as far as we can. Um, and kind of thirdly, I, I kind of touched it before, we, we still expect quantitative reasoning to play a large role in our work. Um, we still find using spreadsheets very useful, but m I think more so than with direct interventions, we're going to put less weight in these. Like, we know that some of the assumptions that goes into these, go into these spreadsheets are going to be very, very difficult to justify. 
Um, it's also possible, and I just say, you know, this won't lead to any changes. Um, we haven't completed our investigations yet, and we want to keep an open mind and not just kind of do this because it's exciting and shiny. Um, my best guess is we will be able to find opportunities in this area, and in fact, we have already made two grants, um, but it's still fairly early days. Um, just before I finish up, I did, I did want to mention, you know, I've focused on the kind of public reg health regulation work we've done here. Um, we have also made two grants in policy already. Um, so one was to the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention, which I mentioned, and then the other was to the Innovation in Government Initiative. And I see Claire and Sam are just sitting there. Maybe you should put your hands up. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them today, but um, I thoroughly recommend you should talk to Claire and Sam because they're really interesting and their organization is very exciting for us. Um, yeah, so what does this mean for you? I think two things. So one, uh, as donors, um, I expect that within the next year or two, um, GiveWell is going to be presenting a different suite of giving opportunities. Um, we're uncertain exactly how we're going to do that. It could be, here are some recommendations. Um, we think these two charities are great. It's more likely, I think, to be a more fund approach. Um, so you might contribute to a fund, and then we would use that to fund um, opportunities kind of which haven't been defined in advance. Uh, I think one thing about these kind of opportunities, it's, it's less every dollar has this kind of marginal impact and kind of specific grant funding to do specific activities might be a better way of doing that. Um, the other implication is that we're hiring. Uh, and so, um, Josh, could you put your hand up? So Josh is um, currently tasked with doubling the size of our current research staff from about 12 to over 20 um, in the next three years. And we're particularly excited to have people you know, involved in the effective altruism community apply. Um, we've had a lot of success with that in the past. Uh, so if you have any interest in working at GiveWell, I'd recommend kind of just finding someone who works at GiveWell, possibly Josh, possibly me. Um, I'm doing office hours from 3 p.m. Uh, and I'd love to talk to you. Um, we're mostly going to be looking for experienced researchers, managers, and people who've worked in global health and development before. Um, but we also expect to be hiring a number of junior staff kind of straight out of, out of college. Great. So, um, yeah, that's everything I had to say. Uh, yeah, my, my office hours at 3 p.m. Please, I'd love to see as many as possible. Um, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Cool. And now we move to Q&A land right over here. Awesome. Um, so I have a few questions here from the app. Um, your first question, sir, is what is your plan for when GiveWell's ideas or agendas run afoul of the preferences of politically powerful or well-funded competing interests? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think that has a generalizable answer. Um, I expect that it's not going to be GiveWell that runs afoul of these competing interests. I expect it will be, to a large extent, the particular grants we make, and those competing interests will be different in different cases. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm not going to be able to give a very satisfying answer to this, except to say that um, generally it's going to be domain specific, it's going to depend on the specific grant, um, and we think that many of the, right, the kind of best people to be making those kind of tactical decisions on the ground likely aren't funders. So we want to be just very humble and recognize what, what we're good at and what we don't know and not kind of micromanage grantees. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a note, in six minutes, the next talks will begin. So at any point, if people need to shuffle rooms, go ahead. And I'm going to continue doing the Q&A and do as you need in terms of moving spaces. Um, so next question, would you see opportunities in policy intervention that affect multiple cause areas simultaneously, such as within affirmative voting methods? Yes, um, so I don't know much about affirmative voting methods in particular, but if you remember the kind of slide of all those bubbles, I think one of the things that's challenging about you, kind of, you try and carve up the space to just simplify it and make sense. Right? But this doesn't really reflect reality. It's our kind of very sim simplified model of reality. Um, and so at least some of these, I think you can kind of think about impact in terms of this pyramid, and some, of, some things are very much at the top and will affect like multiple different things. And so if you can improve I mean, political institutions in a country, that's going to have some effect on health eventually. There are kind of causal arrows that go down that way. Um, now, we decided to start, you know, as I said, kind of fairly proximate to impact um, and in a fairly specific sense, uh, because we think that's the most tractable thing to do in the short term. But in the long term, we'd love to kind of look at areas that are much broader than what we're currently doing. Thank you. Um, last question is, how much paternalism is appropriate and not excessive? Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid someone might ask that. So, um, so I think there might be a, 
I think one distinction I'd like to make is between, um, and I, uh, apologies if I'm kind of butchering the language here, but, but between uh, what I call paternalism and what I call um, some, uh, like having a neo-colonialist attitude or something. And I think one might be, um, I think paternalism to me is about individuals and individual restrictions and liberty, whereas a neo-colonialist attitude might be closer to kind of not respecting the democratic norms of a country. Um, now, I think to address the paternalism question first, um, you know, what, often what we're doing here is you know, public health regulation often does have a paternalistic element. Right? Um, it often, and, and there are some nuances around that. So tobacco control, tobacco taxes. Um, there was very strong pushback on that early on in the kind of story of, of how tobacco control like evolved um, until uh, the secondhand smoke kind of issue got discovered, and then suddenly it was okay. You're like hurting other people. We can, we can do this. But, but I think it, it is still true that the, large, mo the biggest gains we've had are still health benefits for you know, the individuals who smoke themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think there are some cases, and, and it, this is interesting because it's very difficult to completely divorce this from your politics, I think. So if you are a complete like, hardcore libertarian, um, I don't think you should be giving to these particular opportunities. Um, but I think most people think there are at least some cases in which people are systematically making like, bad decisions. Um, and that's not just because you know, they live in low-income countries. That's true in high-income countries as well. Um, and so you know, if we feel fairly comfortable with having some level of paternalism in the, in, you know, the USA or, or the UK, um, unless there are kind of particularly different social norms in another country, I, I don't think that there's a, necessarily a reason to be um, much more cautious in this kind of other, um, other domain. All right. Thank you so much, James. Cool. That is our talk. There is talk. <laughs>